Okay. So Professor Jenny has more than 20 years experience in research, teaching and training. His research focuses on waste utilization and energy autonomy. For example, he has produced a um, research projects such as the EcoBot, which is a family of robots powered by microbial fuel cells, which I hope he will tell us more about it. And we are really excited uh, to welcome him on this series of uh, EBNET webinars. His presentation is titled Bioelectrochemical Systems from Fundamentals in Robotics to Real World Applications. Thank you very much, uh, Janice, and please share your presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Sharon, for the very nice introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to, to present uh, here at the EPNET uh, webinar. Um, so, um, as, as Sharon mentioned, I, I will uh, be uh, talking about uh, bioelectrochemical systems uh, and try to articulate um, the, the approach we've taken over the years, which was a journey that started by looking into robotics as a, as a practical application and, and how that has enabled us to understand some, some of the technology parameters a little bit better so that we could then implement it in, in other systems as well. So that's the, that's the storyline for, for today. Um, so uh, I spent uh, more than uh, 20 years of, of my life uh, or academic life in a robotics laboratory. And the main objective in, in, in that kind of line of research uh, has been to understand how uh, natural systems, how biological agents in particular um, behave in their natural environments and, and learn from that. So that then we could mimic that or copy that and try to engineer it. I'm showing several examples on this slide and you will see later it's on. It's stuffy in here this morning. Yeah, it's very, very hot. Yeah, it's quite kind of hot. Yeah, it's quite uh, from our uh, robotics application that we are nowhere near the, uh, the, the biological agent and, and our engineering approach is, uh, is haphazard to, uh, to, to say the least, but at least we've tried to uh, mimic some of the, the basic symbiotic mechanisms uh, that we understood would be valuable for uh, autonomous systems in general, starting with, with robotics. So if, let me see if I can get my um, point there. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not uh, I'm not going to go through all of the examples in detail, but just just suffice to say, and you will see some of these examples. So for example, the the water boatman, uh, which is a, uh, an amazing insect with a remarkable ability to run and walk on on water. So that that's a it's a good system from an engineering perspective to understand how that's done and, and how it, it feeds and, and behaves. There are several examples of uh, endosomatic uh, symbiosis, uh, like the cow with the ruminant stomach and exosomatic symbiosis, like the termites and their fungal cultures, or the pameridia uh, insect, uh, which is freely roaming the otherwise carnivorous sticky stems of the Rorigula plant uh, and able to consume the prey that has been caught and, and then through defecation, it feeds the, the plant. And there's some other uh, examples of, um, like for example, the desert um, lizard um, in a very dry environment is able to uh, absorb or absorb as, as much uh, humidity as there is available in that environment, otherwise it, it dies. So from a material perspective, uh, microcapillary tubes within the skin and, and things like that, and some other uh, sunfish and the half moon fish kind of grooming each other and helping each other. So uh, some of the, these are only some of the examples we've been uh, kind of inspired by, and, and there are of course uh, kind of now getting into the microbiology. There are, of course, other examples of natural reactions, 
that we know are happening, like the two examples I'm showing of iron oxidizing bacteria on the left, and then the very common kind of biofouling on the right. All these are um, reactions that are um, it, it, transferring electrons from one um, site to, to the next, and we see the result in a very visible way, as we see here. So trying to put together um, systems that are behaving uh, as close to the biological agents, the larger life forms that I showed uh, on the previous slide, but uh, run or powered by the microbial mechanisms I'm showing on, on this slide has been the, the main focus of, of our um, research. Um, <laughs> and just to, to go through a little bit of the, this is a, um, sorry, just to go through a little bit of the microbiology um, that we're dealing with in, in our systems. This is a, uh, a nice schematic I borrowed from my very good friend, uh, Professor Hans Kurt uh, Fleming at the University of duisburg uh, and, and this is effectively the, the water column. Uh, so from uh, aerobic on the top or, uh, all the way to the kind of anaerobic sediment or substratum um, that we may be using to, at the bottom and the different um, carbon primarily reactions, aerobic reactions on the top, facultative uh, anaerobic reactions in the middle and then the strict anaerobic reactions at the bottom. But the same can be said about the, uh, the nitrogen cycle where nitrification, nitrification takes place. And of course, the sulfur cycle and the iron manganese cycle, and the, the latter links to the photo I was showing on the previous slide. So it's it's kind of a, it's a very basic textbook kind of um, diagram. But it, the message here is that we are we are working with these different metabolisms, especially when we are uh, uh, bringing in mixed communities from our natural environment, and we expect them to to work together in in a kind of a column manner where we have the, the oxygen gradient uh, working in our favor. And so taking these um, uh, microbial communities and, and putting them in a microbial fuel cell, this is the schematic of what, how we understand it looks like or it works and this is what it looks like in reality. Uh, the, the photo on the top right uh, shows the stereotypical uh, double chamber microbial fuel cell separated by the by proton exchange or ion exchange membrane and the photo on the bottom with the, the 2D diagram on the, on the right is where we have advanced the technology to simplify it, use lower cost uh, but more robust uh, materials um, so that we we can then start thinking better about the, the scale up and where it can be used. So it's a static um, schematic and I'll just run through it. Um, our kind of um, microbes, they are facultative uh, anaerobic organisms. Some are strictly anaerobic organisms, so they will be closer to the bottom of the anode chamber that's shown on the, on the left. Um, the electrode uh, close to the, the communities and close to the membrane uh, on the, the anode side, and then we have a cathode electrode on the cathode side. So once uh, carbon energy is provided, um, then we have the tricarboxylic uh, cycle in, in action. Uh, we have electrons flowing down the electron transport chain from the uh, most negative um, cytochrome or redox cap that we know uh, down to the most positive, which is of course the oxygen. Um, and with the help of soluble mediators, whether these are naturally occurring, like um, sulfur, for example, uh, or nitrate, um, or artificial mediators, this is how the work began back in the 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s when people were using things like neutral red, methylene blue, uh, HMQ, uh, thionine as artificial soluble mediators that would mimic what the naturally occurring soluble mediators would be would be doing. And, and we're effectively playing with the, the voltage differential between the oxidized form of the soluble mediator 
that's then attracted to the appropriate level on the electron transport chain. So then it can be electrochemically reduced. And once it's electrochemically reduced, then there's a, there's a different voltage differential between the now electron carrying mediator and the anode electrode, which is connected through a circuit to the cathode electrode. So we have an electrophilic attraction uh, between those two electrodes. And that drives this process of the reduced mediators electrocatalytically reoxidizing at the electrode surface. And because, as I mentioned, the anode and the cathode are connected together, then we have this kind of third voltage differential, which is, of course, the difference between the two half cells, and then allows electrons to flow from the anode to the cathode. On the cathode, we may have oxygen if it's open to air, like the ceramic uh, photo I'm showing on the bottom right, or we may have a closed chamber like the photo on the left, on the, sorry, on the top right, and we may be playing with different oxidizing uh, agents like ferricyanide, for example, which gets reduced to ferrocyanide. Uh, and so along the, 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 the charge transfer electrons coming through the circuit, we have cations, I'm only showing uh, protons here, but that clearly depends on the membrane, on the material, and the porosity of the, of the separator or membrane that we are using. Electron neutrality will um, drag uh, positively charged cations from the reactions that are taking place here through the membrane and along with the electron incoming electrons from the circuit, they will recombine uh, reacting with the uh, oxidizing agent, be it oxygen or ferrocyanide or chelates or different other um, substances that have been used. Um, this is the, the planktonic uh, version or explanation of how electrons are taken out of the inner uh, metabolism of organisms and transferred uh, across. Uh, and this is a very kind of crude and very simple or simplistic explanation. Uh, we also have uh, anodophilic or electroactive uh, organisms. Uh, they're called like that because they have a preference for conductive surfaces because these organisms, they directly conduct electricity through uh, nanowires, conductive uh, pili. Um, and they have therefore the ability to colonize uh, a conductive electrode material. Uh, and through that colonization, they basically anchor themselves onto the electrode surface and they use those anchorages as their conductive um, pili which will allow electrons to flow directly through from the inner Krebs cycle all the way down to the electrode surface. Um, so an example of that, it's a um, Schoenella um, um, bacterium and it's uh, uh, work from Moel Najar's group. It's, it's from 2010, it's, it's quite an important um, piece of work that has been done to try and capture this uh, process of electron transfer from uh, those um, uh, appendages that are being reeled out of the of the microbes, and in uh, in recent kind of interactions with colleagues, have been studying these mechanisms for for decades. Um, they they've they've reported the the one kind of directional flow of electrons. Uh, and that very much depends on the species, but also on the substratum that they're exchanging electrons uh, with. So when the, the conductive nano wire or the cable, conductive cable is still attached to the organism, it's a one-way transfer. So it works like a diode. It only goes from the micro to the electrode surface. When the, the, the micro is treated and is removed and we have the, the cable on its own, then the characteristics are, are such that it, it behaves like a wire. So electrons can, can move in both directions, which is uh, quite remarkable. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're very much looking for biofilms such as, such as uh, this. This is uh, some of our work, scanning electro uh, microscopy of Geobacter biofilms growing on 
uh, carbon fiber veil. Uh, and from memory, this is a, a standard stereotypical um, microwave fuel cell as the photo I was showing on the top right on the previous slide. Uh, and it was loaded with a, a suboptimal load to begin with. Um, despite the fact that the carbon fiber veil electrode we used in those experiments was a large, a large surface area which was folded down, um, the so, so, some colleagues were um, hypothesizing that the microbes will only be colonizing the outer layers of the multi-layered folded down carbon fiber veil. These are image from, images from the inner layers, uh, kind of proving that if there's enough space and there's enough perfusion of uh, carbon energy, microbes will colonize all the available sites or most of the available sites to be a little bit more exact uh, on the electrode surface. So it makes it a, a more efficient substratum for colonization and therefore for electron obstruction and electron transfer. Um, <clears throat> so when we then start looking at the data that we have been generating from these uh, microwave fuel cells, uh, these are some of the characteristic uh, curves that we, we've, we've tried to do, correlating optical density at uh, different levels. Um, power output and, and current output. And the data points you see on the graphs, those were um, generated following steady states. And on the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll show what we mean by steady states. Um, these were uh, the same kind of standard microbial fluorescence. We were using the same tool to try and understand how the microbes uh, behave. And therefore, the levels of current and power you see are, are quite low. But Still, these have allowed us to understand how better we can establish these biofilms, how we may maintain a stable population, especially in a continuously flowing system. The microbes will continue to grow. That's a process that that's continues. But in a continuously flowing system, we would like um, uh, uh, an electrode to be constantly colonized by the same uh, population size, uh, but clearly with new generation, new progeny of cells. Dead cells and new daughter cells that do not have uh, access to any available sites on the electrode, they simply get washed out. So we're left with a fixed population on the electrode. And what we saw here is that we can increase the amount of biomass in a microbial uh, fuel cell of that kind of geometry, but up to a certain point and beyond which we don't see much improvement. So there's a there's an optimum kind of trade-off that we need to hit. And here are some uh, characteristic curves of power uh, and current. When we talk about steady states, we have been recording uh, really flat lines uh, from uh, Sean and Langeobacter when we were um, setting up a pure culture microbial fuel cells. And we wanted to see this, these flat lines to uh, and then argue that we have at least pseudo steady states. And for that length of time, it's, it's a little bit beyond pseudo. Uh, they seem to be quite stably on the, on the electrode surface. And not only that, when we kind of kept the system under the, the same conditions, environmental conditions, uh, we also wanted to see what happens if we perturb the, the system uh, and see if we can have dynamic steady states, whereby when a condition is changed, uh, like for example, the external load, this is a very simple experiment that uh, we, we did, we, we record um, a different level of uh, steady state, but it's still steady. The, the wave-like um, behavior you see, that's the diurnal. We were not in an incubator or, or a kind of a, a, a high-end thermostatic environment. So we still uh, see the, the effect of temperature because of the diurnal cycle. And then we change, when we change the external resistor again, we see a new steady state uh, being established. And when we come back, to a previous condition, we, we we go back to exactly the same level as we were before. 
Um, and this is this is quite useful, especially if we are thinking about these systems um, being used for information processing. This is a little bit of unconventional computation we've been thinking about because we get steady states and because the biofilms can be maintained um, in those conditions. We we could then start interpreting the data we see based on what is happening around the microbial fuel cell as sensory information, information that then can be used for uh, processing. So coming into the uh, robotics and, and how we, we then started um, thinking about uh, the systems, as I said, we've always been looking into nature for inspiration and trying to copy what we understood would be mechanisms that we could replicate in the lab. And, and the objective is still to have autonomous systems, whether they are mobile uh, and they can perform locomotion uh, along other uh, functions, or whether they are stationary and they perform efficient wastewater treatment, but they autonomously sense their own environment and make decisions whether to open and close valves. It's, it's the same challenge. With robotics, we have the additional challenge of overcoming friction and, and transferring mass. Um, so that's that's a different engineering challenge, and that's where we've uh, put a lot of effort and energy to develop microwave fuels so that would allow us to um, to achieve that. Um, so this is part of uh, ongoing work, uh, and it, it shows you the, the vision that we want to get to a fully kind of bionic or microbionic um, robot, whereby things like um, sound, vision, uh, tactile sensing, orientation, olfaction, uh, taste, um, uh, phototaxis, photosensing are all driven by um, biological processes inside microwave fuel cells. Um, and, and the whole system is then integrated together to behave like, like one of the life forms uh, uh, I showed. Uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, later on as I go through the history of the ECOPs. Before getting to um, to that, I just wanted to show this uh, graph. This was generated uh, from our lab, a previous lab in, in Bristol, and it was part of an overview of the work that we had done uh, in nearly 20 years. The, the red curve shows the reduction in uh, bioreactor volume, uh, and you can see two, uh, three different gradients, uh, which I will explain. And the blue curve shows the uh, level of a power output in absolute terms on the uh, left y-axis. The volume is on the right y-axis. So this uh, is a period of time that we have been playing with uh, lots of um, plastic, polymeric, 3D printed uh, materials and setting up our microbial fuel cells in different geometries that would serve different purposes of the experiments. Uh, this is when we started experimenting with ceramic materials and with ceramic materials it's a different behavior. Yes, we still get uh, uh, power improvement, but as you can see, it's a smaller decreases in volume there, resulting in much, much larger increases in, in power output. Uh, and here, what we see is that from the uh, uh, significant reduction in, in volume, we still record pretty much the same level of uh, power output in absolute terms. So looking at the, if we were normalizing to the volume of the electrode for density, then the, the improvement is uh, significant. And that's, uh, that's about 2.5 uh, milliwatts of power that we recorded from a 3.6 milliliters of uh, volume of uh, microwave fuel cell. It's 3D printed polymer uh, chassis, but we have a, a, a ring, a ceramic ring going around it as the membrane. So it's a, it's a combination of the two uh, different types of approaches that we've, we've had over the years. And that gave us the highest level of power output 
for that small volume. And so the, uh, it's also been a, a design kind of journey for us, uh, not, not just designing the microbial fuel system, trying to use the appropriate materials, always pushing the envelope for higher and higher power output, but it's also a design of the, of the, bot the robotic uh, platforms themselves to be able to accommodate the microbial fuel cell that we had as the state of the art at the time uh, and, and run and perform the function that it's supposed to be performing. So these are some of the examples of the microbial fuel cells we designed, uh, we actually customized uh, to uh, specifically uh, work in a, in a particular scenario. Those fuel cells I'm showing there um, in the middle are the fuel cells we used on the third family of uh, or ECOBOTs. This is ECOBOT 1, ECOBOT 2. Uh, and these are the different parts that make up ECOBOT 3 uh, you see here. So, <clears throat> starting with uh, ECOBOT 1, um, we, we were given this task of uh, uh, developing a very simple robot with a very simple behavior, but uh, see it running with microbial fuels and what you saw on the in the movie running on the bottom right was an injection of E. coli and blended with methylene blue. We didn't know enough about electroactive organisms, so we played with a non-electroactive organism and we had to add synthetic methylene blue to help with the electron extraction I was saying before. And we gave this a very simple phototactic behavior. The robot doesn't even know how to stop before it falls over the, uh, the, the edge of the bench. Um, so we we were intentionally placing the the robot on the bench. It's about 70 centimeters uh, distance, facing um, the other direction from the light. We designed uh, or pre-programmed a light-seeking sequence in its uh, behavior repertoire. Um, so it's kind of turn clockwise if you don't see light. It's as simple as that. So you see the robot kind of turning clockwise until it detects with the two photodiodes the light source. The two photodiodes are differentially connected. It's called differential drive because they are cross-connected to the motors. The, the photodiode on the left is connected to the right motor. The photodiode on the right is connected to the left. So depending on which photodiode is picking up the most intense light signal, the opposite motor is powered to driving in the right direction. We used a small bank of electrolytic capacitors. There were no super caps at the time. This is uh, 2002. Um, and we only used it as a, as a kind of an energy um, storage, energy uh, charge discharge with a duty cycle. So there's a real time clock in the background, just to complete the explanation. Um, and you can see how long it took this little robot is about uh, 30 centimeters in diameter uh, to perform the light seeking sequence uh, successfully and then homing home into the light source. And then I had to go and pick it up. Otherwise, it would continue and go and crash into the, the light source. In order to do this, we before we, we ran the experiment, uh, we did run a characterization experiment on the same um, geometry of microbial fuel cells that you see being plugged in to the robot. And we, we played with different carbohydrates and, and proteins to try and see what is the best material that we could be feeding this, uh, this robot. And we ended up feeding it with um, uh, sucrose uh, because we had plenty of, and we didn't want to uh, complicate the experiments further with recalcitrant uh, chitin uh, that would would accumulate in the bottom of those um, cells. Um, so we then uh, we were then asked uh, the question. That's fine. You you very nicely refined the food that you fed uh, your robot, and you kept it nicely on the bench, and you injected the the food in the microbial fuel cells. What if the robot was in a natural environment and it was uh, expected to collect and somehow process 
its food, its feedstock, and power itself. So we had to address that question in this way. We performed, uh, again, a characterization experiment uh, with the same microwave fuel system, but now instead of refined cellulose, we were using grass uh, clippings uh, as a source of cellulose. Instead of chitin, we used prawn shells. Instead of um, uh, chitin and other types of uh, protein, we used um, flies. Um, whole insects or pieces of, of the insect, and in terms of pectin and, and fructose and other uh, kind of uh, proteins, we used rotten biomass, same kind of um, hexose equivalent um, amounts, quantities going into the same microwave fuel cells, and then again trying to understand what is the best uh, substrate that a, a robot would potentially be feeding on. Along those lines, we also performed experiments with uh, landfill leachate. We were literally collecting uh, leachate from uh, different manholes of uh, uh, landfills that had uh, been uh, non-operational for more than a decade. Uh, we were bringing it in, in neat, and we were then running it through a, a cascade of tubular microwave fuels, that's the photo in the middle bottom. We also looked at uh, biodegradable material and um, how, if we used it as a membrane in a microbial fuel cell, how long it would take for that membrane to be completely consumed in the process by the microbes. Of course, if it's used as a membrane, which is separating an animal and cathode, that also means the end of the microbial fuel cell. But there may be operations where we want that to happen because the, the fuel cells or the robot have to stop after a period of time and naturally biodegrade in the environment without um, imposing on the environment. And there was also a line of work where we took a live algae and we were feeding live algae into the microbial fuel cell anode as the feedstock, of course, trying not to change the community dynamics, otherwise the algae would uh, dominate and then stop the microbial fuel cell from, from working. And then what you see here is the experiment with the dead flies. That's an artificial stomach that we put together, which is what we used on Ikubo 3. You saw three flies going in and after a few days, those flies sunk, which meant that the exoskeleton was penetrated by the microbes. Three more flies were added, and again, they sunk, which meant that the microbes were doing their, their job. Uh, it's a static environment. There was no um, agitation, there was no kind of continuous flow or anything like that. It's just a static environment as a pre-digester. And we wanted to understand if we use these flies, which we characterize through bomb calorimetry, to contain something like 86, 87 joules of energy, uh, how long would it take for the flies to be fully consumed? And first of all, can they be fully consumed? How long it would take? Uh, and then calculate the energy dynamics. How much energy can we get out of these insects? And uh, out of the six flies that we added to this kind of controlled experiment, after we finished, we could only find two intact flies. This was 27 days, so uh, almost a calendar month. Uh, and, and the other four insects completely disappeared. We could still find some legs and a couple of wings, uh, but the, the rest of the insect uh, was completely consumed. So it was proof positive. We, we could, uh, for example, build a mobile fly trap uh, roaming whatever environment uh, and then see uh, the robot getting its energy from the flies or the insects that it's trapping. So here's uh, Ecobot uh, 2 following those lines of experiment. Um, we, we're now using a mixed community of symbiotic organisms, of five symbiotic organisms, two Pseudomonas, um, Dysophobia, Dysophuricans, Enterococcus uh, fecalis, and E. coli in the mix. Uh, and it was working along the lines of the diagram I showed earlier that I borrowed from uh, Hans Kurt uh, Fleming. So it's a water column. We have the distal vibrio all the way down to the bottom. We added some slate, homogenized slate, just to introduce that kind of anaerobic sediment. 
uh, we were co we were replicating the work of Haberman and Palmer, which was published in 1991, and they reported this kind of mixture of organisms working for something like five years consuming uh, wastewater. So we replicated that. We saw that that community works well. We put that community in the eight microwave fuels. As you will notice, that the robot is now different in configuration. We also changed color because we ran out of blue styrene uh, foam. We put the microwave fuels in the configuration because we're no longer using ferrous cyanide as we did in Ecobot uh, one. The cathodes are open to air, and the microbes uh, are doing their job. We did this experiment feeding Ecobot with uh, sucrose just to be able to compare with Ecobot one, but we then fed it with uh, grass clippings, prawn shells, uh, and dead flies, uh, and, and recorded the experiments. For demonstration purposes, the robot is moving towards a halogen light source. So as it's doing that, because we developed the robot to not only perform phototaxis, but do something more useful, uh, is recording the temperature and wirelessly transmitting that information to the base station, which is uh, nearby. So we're, we're recording the temperature gradient as it's approaching the halogen light source. And then in Cobalt 3, <clears throat> these are the, mic the microbial fuels as I showed in the design slide uh, before, um, is a culmination of the, of the two put together. But now, we're not manually feeding the microbial fuel cells with those substrates. We built the robot with the artificial stomach on the top, uh, where the laser point is, is, is showing, with a, a fashionable hat that has been working or designed to work as a fly trap. So we put it in a controlled environment uh, <clears throat> with the idea that we introduce maggots, which would then hatch a known number of, which would then hatch into flies, and the flies would then be attracted uh, by the kind of the fly trap, go into the, the, the pre-digester stomach, uh, and then take the digest and feed it into the 48 small microbial fuel cells that we have as part of the, of the robot. Um, so there were a number of pumps, a number of motors, and a full-scale microcomputer on board. The robot is moving to our left and right. It's making contact with the end of its world to ask for food. You, you see here there's food being pumped into the, the hat, which then flows into the artificial stomach. This is when flies were not the, the feedstock. And then it's moving all the way to our left, and it's basically asking its world for, for water. Uh, <clears throat> so this is, again, it's a step towards autonomy. Uh, the robot is still dependent on the, on the world, on the environment, to have liquid food and water, um, because there's evaporative losses to recover the, the water loss. Um, so if it was fully autonomous, it should be able to detect where food is and water is and, and go and collect it. Nevertheless, we successfully showed that this robot could run for about 10 days uh, autonomously. And please notice the real time clock in the background again to see how long it took for the energy to accumulate in the much larger bank of electrolytic capacitors. This was just before 2010 just before the discovery of uh, supercaps. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, but there's enough energy for the robot to then uh, collect its food and water, process that through the, the artificial stomach, power the pump that feeds the first tier of microbial fuel cells, overflow to the second tier of microbial fuel cells, overflow to a collection trough, then feed back into the stomach again a number of times because <clears throat> we know the hydraulic retention time was insufficient to fully utilize the rich food we've been feeding, the, the microbes, or uh, if it was the, the flies. And at the end of the day, there's a peristaltic pump at the bottom of the artificial stomach, uh, which is pushing out the useless waste from the sedimentation that's uh, happening in the in the stomach. So that was intentional to show that we could do 
fresh food ingestion, onboard digestion, and waste ingestion. At least demonstrate the thermodynamic cycle uh, as part of the, of the robot. And here's the inspiration for, for it. And uh, going with the water boatman and changing the material, still the same principle. It's an ecobot. We called it robot, and you'll now see why, uh, because it has the ability, because of the soft compliance uh, body, to open two uh, mouths and row itself forward in an otherwise contaminated environment. By doing so, it's bringing in uh, fresh food. Once it does that, the two mouths close, uh, and the two microbial fuels, which is uh, the system that we use to power this very energy efficient uh, robot, consume what has been collected. They charge the capacitors whilst they're consuming. And once there's enough energy for the robot to actuate again, it opens the two mouths and by rowing itself forward, it's bringing in fresh food and pushing out the digested uh, food. So the, the idea with this is kind of algal blooms, contaminated water bodies, and these uh, robots as a fleet roaming the environment and cleaning, cleaning it. Uh, <clears throat> along uh, those lines, we, we did a kind of a field trial. Uh, we didn't have the, the, row, uh, uh, the rowing element. We did have a, a propeller attached to an eco boat uh, that we put uh, in a uh, denitrification tank of one of the largest uh, wastewater treatment plants in Milan through uh, our collaborators at RSC. Um, we had two boats, a small and a large one, and we were we just threw them in the denitrification tank and we kept them tethered um, just to be able to see the the voltage of the the energy from the fuel cells developing as the microbes are colonizing the exposed to the liquid uh, anodes that you see here. So we used cylindrical, the same cylindrical MFCs I showed in the, in the first few slides when describing the microbial fuel cell. Uh, but because this is connected as a circuit and there's current drawn uh, from day one, when we threw the, the, um, the boat in the denitrification tank, then that's an attractive medium, an attractive surface for electroactive organisms, the appropriate electroactive organisms to attach themselves. And then the, the, the boat started running and giving us the information we wanted to see. The most interesting uh, finding from this uh, work that we reported is the uh, Nocido wastewater treatment plant staff they would go out to their different um, stages and collect samples for COD analysis back in the lab on an hourly basis. And what we saw was that we, we had um, the, our analog voltage coming out of these fuel cells or the boats was very, very roughly, if not accurately, following the, uh, the COD measurements that the, the staff were doing on an hourly basis. So it worked really well as a sensor. And then using that knowledge, we then started thinking, OK, it doesn't always have to be a robot. What, How else can we use the technology? This is a, a slightly different platform. This is our EcoBot 4. But we, we disconnected the, the brain and the robots, and we just used the stack of the, of the robot as the power source to charge at the time to charge a brick phone, even at the time no one was using a brick phone, but that was the phone that we wanted to demonstrate that we could power from flat uh, and then use it normally. Uh, a few years later, we of course did a smartphone, did all the characterization of how long it took to fully charge from completely flat and how much energy was accumulated in that period of time uh, <clears throat> and what system we of microbial fuels we used. Uh, we also then went all the way down to the micro scale, thinking about wearable microbial fuel cells. This is a very brave Majid, who's wearing 24 tubular microbial fuel cells, which are full of urine, human urine. The idea is that if this is part of a gear, then the person uh, is able to use their waste as the fuel to power a gadget, in this case, the GPS locator, um, 
which is transmitting information to a base station. So it could become a, 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 a search and rescue kind of kit that's powered by an individual who's alive and healthy enough to urinate and then send their coordinates to be um, rescued. And that's the, the tubular MFC that was used. Uh, <clears throat> I spoke about the design of microbial fuels and the different materials we, we use. This is a European project we had with partners who had the clever idea of converting a 3D printer to a liquid handling machine. And we took uh, one of the uh, prototypes and used it as a microbial fuel cell uh, maintenance machine. So what we've got uh, here, I think I may need to press it if I uh, go back to my cursor, if I knew how to do that. Uh, <clears throat> then you see here the, the head, the printer head is, is programmed to read the output of the nine microwave fuels, these are the eco microwave fuels we were using. Uh, it's sped up uh, video, but it's picking up which microbial fuels is underperforming. And then it goes and feeds that microbial fuels to bring microbial fuels to bring it up to the same level as the rest. So it's a way of uniformly maintaining, inoculating, growing, and maintaining a, a stack of microbial fuels, which can then uh, have no discrepancy in terms of internal impedance, and it can be easily used in series or in parallel uh, for the appropriate application. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> going a step further, when uh, once we did the material investigation, we then uh, <clears throat> had another uh, large European project, which was asking us to introduce microbial fuels into the very fabric of our homes and our dwellings and, and bricks. We started by taking off-the-shelf bricks that had cavities and then introduced electrodes and, and run them as microbial fuels in different events. We also took Venetian bricks and we machined them to put the materials and run them as microbial fuel cells. But of course, this was not what the project was asking us. It, we were challenged with uh, developing a whole system of bioreactors and photobioreactors uh, and some genetically modified organisms to produce energy from household wastewater, but also recover useful chemicals. And in this case, we're recovering inorganic uh, phosphate and producing energy. So this is the wall uh, in, uh, in the lab as we built it. It's again sped up. Um, these are the 15 3D printed microbial fuel cell bricks or bio bricks that we produced as part of the project. These are the photobioreactors that are producing the nice kind of uh, algal biomass that's coming and helping the cathodes for oxygen reduction reaction. But we run the, the brain of the, of the wall using the power from the microbial fuel cells. We couldn't run the lights of the photobioreactors. Those were too power consuming. But as a token of what we could uh, do with the energy, we, we in, in installed a small motorized window mimicking motorized windows we now have in modern buildings. Uh, and we were able to power that every two minutes. So if this was part of a modern household, that energy could be coming from the household wastewater, opening and closing the windows to keep it uh, under thermostatic conditions. And then the, the scaled up, uh, version of that is the peak power uh, urinal that we've been taking to Glastonbury since 2015. This is the 2019 uh, festival. Um, these are the systems that we put around the back. There's four systems. They're all connected uh, together, but we we had them running different things. So the urinal is good enough for 50 people. We partitioned the urinal. Half of the urinal is, is running on energy storage, just like the ecobots. So energy during the day from the microbial fuels is uh, uh, fed with urine from the festival goers, is accumulating in uh, lithium ion or lithium polymer batteries. And then we turn the lights on at night. The other half of the urinal was directly connected to microbial fuels. There's no energy storage and no switch. So the lights were on all the time during the festival. We also had an electronic sign and the video game that were also powered by the uh, microbial fuels just to engage with the public 
and get them to come and ask questions, get the kids to play with a video game um, and get people interested in, in science. Um, so in the space of the five days or five and a half days of the festival, that's how much energy we generated. Um, bring back my pointer uh, on the top right, uh, which we used to, to power the lights. And as part of the sanitation work that we've been doing for the Gates Foundation, Glastonbury helped us a lot. And the EcoBot work helped us a lot get into Glastonbury and put a system in place to run. But those and that knowledge and those findings were invaluable when we went to our field trials for the Gates Foundation project. Um, this is basically introducing the technology to the sanitation sector uh, to improve sanitation, treat the waste and, and stop uh, disease from spreading, but also provide electricity in remote locations where it's, it was previously unavailable. This is a girls boarding, secondary boarding school in in Kisoro in Uganda, south um, southwestern Uganda, close to the DRC uh, border. It's a school that has had uh, numerous attacks and intrusions, even though it's well fenced and uh, guarded. Uh, and the toilet is the, uh, unfortunately, the environment, unlit toilet is the environment where crime uh, was taking place. There's also lo lots of other um, scenarios, uh, snakes and reptiles and, and spiders hiding in the toilets uh, and attacking the, the pupils. So we went there, we changed the interface to a urine diversion, we put a small hut, we built a small hut to put the microbial fuel cell stack inside. The liquid from the urine diversion is coming out or through the wall, it's that wall there on the bottom left photo, and it's going into the back of the hut and down the header tank, which is on top of the microbial fuel cells. Uh, so we put uh, lights in the cubicles on PIR sensors so that they turn on when the pupils would walk in and turn off uh, when they would walk out. But we had a, a light module on an LDR um, on the outside to illuminate the path. So that light would come on at sunset and would switch off at sunrise. Uh, <clears throat> So this was followed by a couple of other um, uh, installations where we went to other schools and uh, slums and we installed systems to help um, improve sanitation and provide electricity uh, in those locations. Bringing it back to the, the robot, uh, I'm showing one of the examples that uh, we did. So all that knowledge, again, now being put to um, use for the development of uh, our uh, biorobotics. This is the tilt sensor orientation uh, sensor, and it's all powered by MMCs. We have a, a slightly different design of an anode uh, and a cathode at the bottom. It's a very sensitive anode. So we put it on a, on a tilting table, and we were accurately measure, measuring the angle of the table uh, when it was uh, rotating and we were picking up the fact that it was changing the angle. So we use the output of the MFCs as the sensor information that there's, there's a change in, in orientation or in tilt angle. It's just an, an the example to, to show how we're building the, the bio robot. So hopefully with that, and I'm sorry if I've overrun, uh, we, I've, I've shown uh, our understanding of a microbial fuel cell is that it's a platform technology which can take uh, a range of uh, influence as the feedstock. The main driving engine inside is the biofilm and how we treat it, how we allow it to grow healthily. We get direct outputs from the same technology, the treated analyte, power, catholite, which I haven't even mentioned. Uh, we have been using that as a liquid fertilizer. Uh, and we get pathogen killing uh, with a robust biofilm. And then from there on, we can span out all those different uh, applications. Of course, this is work that has been done over uh, two decades and with uh, the, the help and support and work of a, a, a fairly large team at my previous uh, university. And this is all work that's now transferred over to the University of Southampton and where we have already started to uh, further develop the, the technology. So acknowledgement to the colleagues that have helped 
produce all those wonderful experiments. And finally, a big thank you to our uh, sponsors, funders, and collaborators, academic and industrial, particularly EPSRC, European Commission, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Oxfam. And thank you for your patience and for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation, so, so, Janice. Yeah. So uh, feel free to react <laughs> to that, and then I'll just uh, send a clap from my side. Um, you not only show us how bioelectrochemical systems can help power the robots that you are developing, but also how robots can help improve the performance of bioelectrochemical systems, which is uh, really, really great. I was wondering if uh, there are one or two questions, if you would like to raise your hand. Um, that we could take in the last minutes that we have left left for the seminar. Okay, so perhaps I can just start asking a question that I was intrigued with, and this is uh, when you showed us the boat that you place on the sewage uh, treatment works. How did you manage to monitor the performance of that boat? So w was that connected somewhere or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, it was it was tethered. So we had a graph tech uh, data logger, which was um, in a in a in a sealed box by the side of the uh, the nitrification tank, uh, and we have the MFCs connected, just logging the data. Ah, okay, very interesting <laughs> to have that uh, that device in there. Um, I wonder if there are any other questions by the members. Well, uh, again, I think that uh, everyone is. Uh, and perhaps we will get questions later on. So we have a comment over thing, and it's just, uh, I think there is a question coming up uh, in the chat. So I'm yeah. just going to read it. So uh, in here, Sonia says, really, really interesting presentation. Many thanks indeed, very trivial question, but what was the scale of the ceramic pot activated carbon system shown in every, uh, in very early slide? So, so uh, yeah. That's one of the larger, uh, it's, it's only for uh, demonstration purposes, but we did use that in some of the experiments. That's a 50 milliliter internal volume uh, ceramic cylinder with a closed uh, bottom. It's fairly large, it's about 12 centimeters in, in height. Okay. Uh, and 4.5 centimeters in internal diameter. Uh, yeah, very interesting as well, the correlation that you showed. A volume versus power output as well, that sometimes is not a linear correlation by itself. We we also have another question, which will be the last one, I think, in terms of time. So during uh, the operation of the microbial fuel cell in the different robots in different environments, did you not this much fouling of the contact? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. And the, answer, the short answer is yes, we, we did. Uh, in, in, and it depends uh, entirely on the materials that we use. When we were uh, using titanium wire or stainless steel 316 wire or nickel uh, wire, we didn't have that uh, issue. When we were using nickel chrome wire or other stainless steel grates, um, we did see um, the, the contacts literally getting eaten up, disintegrating and breaking. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Yes, indeed, that's a big problem. I think that several of us happened in the laboratory as well. So I think that in the, the I think there's some people that are typing, but in the interest of time, we're going to close uh, the seminar uh, again. Well, appreciating the, the the opportunity gave us to present this fantastic area of research with a lot of impact, and uh, hopefully we will have more activities uh, planned. So, in our working group, uh, which is a uh, 
as part of EPNET, we plan to do seminars every um, term. So we will have one. Uh, the next one will be in the term September, December. So look forward to that. And we are also planning a, a small workshop where we can revise some of the techniques that are used in terms of microbial characterization, polarization, cyclic voltammetry. So keep an eye on that but because we will be announcing through EPNET those, uh, those participation. Again, thanks everyone for connecting. And uh, if you, Janice, or someone from uh, the members that uh, are listening to us have um, people that they would like to invite to give a presentation such as uh, uh, Yanis did today, please let me know and we will take forward uh, your suggestions. Thank you very much, uh, Janice, again, and uh, have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.